1. It's a lot of text, but you know, this is one of those passages that's near and dear to most of us that's been in church a while, and, and uh, we, uh, we're used to many of the biblical accounts of uh, Scripture, so I think it'd be great for us to read this whole section, and then I just want to pull out some, some concepts. I know that you're familiar with the story, most of us are. Uh, if you're not, then you're gonna, it's going to become one of your favorites. But, um, but I think we're, we're familiar with the story by and large. What I'd like us to do uh, tonight is I'm just going to pull out um, three ideas that I think that the Spirit of God is communicating to us through uh, this, and it's a historical account, a true account, of, of Joseph. So uh, I'll share that with you as we move along. He says, After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams. But there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then, of the, chief, then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captains of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard, and when he told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted it to us, so it came about. It was restored, I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who, who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate the first seven plump cows, but when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing one on one, uh, on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to the magicians. But there was no one who could explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is, it is, as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. 
But after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow. For it will be very severe. And the doubling of the Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the product of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the, the authority of Pharaoh for, good, for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants, and Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you. You, are, you shall be over my house and all my people, uh, and shall order themselves as you command. Only as, re as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot and they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephathnath-Penath, and he gave him in marriage to Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered this, the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and, and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, and he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it, and Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until, the sea, un, until he increased until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born of, to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all of my hardship and all my fa father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come. And as Joseph had said, there was famine in all the land, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, what he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians for the famine, was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. All right, so what we have here is, is the, what we call, what I would say is Joseph, God's redemptive plan revealed. So all this time, we've had this mysterious we might call bitter providence that has been uh, a common thread in Joseph's life. Uh, we've talked about how that, you know, even though he was loved by his fathers, he was hated by his brothers and then threatened to kill him and then they sold him into slavery and then he uh, was falsely accused and then he winds up in jail or in the, the prison and, uh, and even there he served the Lord uh, but then was forgotten when he interpreted the dreams. And so we've seen this downward spiral 
for Joseph's life. A bitter providence is one, is one way of looking at it. Uh, because we, we saw over and over that God was in control of all this. This wasn't just, you know, poor Joseph, you know, he's got bad luck. You know, because the truth is, it's not luck, is it? It's providence. It's God's sovereignty. This is God working in Joseph's life. And even though Joseph had dreams that seemed to indicate that he was going to be exalted, his life was spiraling downward. And now we see a little bit of the fulfillment of the divine dreams that God had given him. We see how this route downward was God's route to elevation. And of course, we see this principle, don't we, all throughout the Bible. You know, that uh, God lifts up the humble, but he abases the proud. And I think you see in this passage that clear teaching, and we'll see that over and over throughout the Bible, is that those that, and what's the ultimate meaning? Is this the secret to success? Humble yourself and you'll be successful? No. The secret is, how do you know God? Those that humble themselves before the Lord, God exalts to be in His presence. Those that exalt themselves against the Lord are humbled eventually and put out of his presence and so we need to see this as in the big picture it's always about not about success it's not about you know any of those things it is about god's redemptive plan it's about knowing god above all else and that's what the bible is teaching us here in many ways so i would say you know we're familiar with the account and i'll talk about some of the the ins and outs that, that's happening here culturally and so forth. But I would say that, number one, Pharaoh, we see in this passage that Pharaoh is humbled to seek help from a Hebrew. I think this is one of the themes that we need to see in this passage. And, and like a lot of times, we, we're so enamored by the miracle or so enamored by the prophecy or or some of the tragedy that might happen, or the victory, uh, that we oftentimes lose the latent theological teaching that's in the passage. And so we need to be careful about that. And I think that's happening here. We, we have, we're so excited as we come along to this passage that finally Joseph is getting a break. Finally, we see how this ends. You know, We see that that Joseph's dreams were going to come true and, uh, and that we, we get this sense of success that, that in, in spite of Joseph's suffering, that, you know, of odds, odd against odds, you know, that he winds up second in command of, of the, one of the most powerful empires of that day. And those are all valid points. But what are we really supposed to take away from this? And I think it becomes very clear that throughout the whole story or the whole account of Joseph, the, the, one of the main points is that God is in sovereign control of everything. We, we are supposed to see how that every intricate detail of this story that appears to be one of the, 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 the most depressing tragedies, you might say, in the Bible... We're supposed to see God is in control of this. This is not just happenstance or, or a bad thing happened to a good person, as the, the old book you know, said. But, but no, this is providence. This is the sovereignty of God arranging the affairs of men in a way that orchestrates His divine plan. And of course... We see here, where I think it'll come, become more and more uh, obvious as we move along, but in verses 1 through 36, one of the things that we should, be, we should see clearly is we have Pharaoh, which if you draw a circle around that part of the world, this is probably the most powerful man in the world, or at least one of them. There were other empires that the Bible doesn't have in view at this point, if we go more toward uh, Ur or other areas, there were other empires going on, but Egypt was definitely 
one of the big superpowers of that time. And yet, here is the mighty Pharaoh reduced to asking for help from a Hebrew slave in prison. And we're meant to see that, okay? We're meant to see that happening. And so we need to be careful that we do not miss it. Uh, Genesis uh, in verses 15 through 16, And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. Now, as part of this, remember what Pharaoh says that he does. He has the dream, and in ancient times, dreams meant a lot, uh, especially if you had the same dream twice. Uh, and especially if you were the king. If the king had a dream like this, if he dreamed the same dream or, or a similar dream multiple times, then it was a time out. It was time to find out what's going on. And this was the time that everybody began to panic. And you might say, well, why does everybody panic? Why does everybody care so much about the king's dream? Well, when you're in the king's palace... And the king is upset because he's had dreams. And the king says, I want an answer for what this means. People start getting a little bit <laughs> scared and sweating a little bit because we realize that in ancient times that if, if, if the king said, I want an answer to this dream, and people could not give it to him, people started losing their lives. And so he calls, like all ancient monarchs, he calls his counselors. Here they're called magicians. Because not like magicians like we think of today, you know that. Uh, they're not the uh, David Copperfield, you know. They, these are wizards you know, of some sort. Not necessarily of dark magic, although it probably would have been in some ways. But not, not always like in the sense that you and I think of as Western magic in that sense but they were they probably studied you know astrology they would have studied incantations they would have probably spoken with spirits and things like that but I just don't want you to get stereotyped into you know tall hats and black and you know this kind of thing it, it they're wizards and and uh, magicians in the sense that they are into uh, the these other gods and the curses and all that kind of stuff that travels with that belief system. We'll see later when Moses confronts uh, Pharaoh, of uh, a different Pharaoh, not the same one, but when, when uh, Moses confronts the Pharaoh, that Pharaoh's magicians can do some of the things that Moses is, and Aaron are able to do. So, you know, I, I say this stuff, you know, because... We Christians need to understand that, that Satan's real, okay, and, and evil is real, and these things, some of these things are, are possible. You know, I, I worked with a guy one time uh, when I was in college, and he was into some of that stuff. And he and I, we were partners, you know, you know at work, so I had to work with him, he had to work with me. And a lot of people were all, you know, talking about that, because how do these two guys work together? But, you know, we did our job. Uh, and, and at the same time, we would have conversations all night long. And he, he, he said, uh, you know, he asked me if I knew what the, uh, the uh, Necronomicon was. And I said, yeah, I know what that is, you know. And he said, well, I read that. I said, you read the, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. He said, well, I've read some of it. So that's the, that's the Egyptian Book of the Dead. He said, I, I've seen, I've seen, uh, a table levitate. We were all standing there, and I saw. He said, "I'm telling you, it was not a trick. You know, we had you know the the meeting, we and all that, and and the devil or whatever, some spirit moved the table." And he said, "I'm telling you, it was not a joke." He said, "I know you probably think I'm a jo I'm joking." I said, "No, I don't think you're joking." I said, "I'm pretty sure." that Satan can pick up a table. 
I can pick up a table. So I'm pretty sure the devil could pick one up, okay? Aren't you? You know. But I said, you need to decide whether you want to serve a created being that can scare people and do things like that, or do you want to worship the creator that that being is going to have to answer to someday? That's up to you. But we Christians need, and I, we need to be sure that we don't make light of evil because evil is real. Uh, in the book of Jude, it says, and we don't know a lot about it other than the fact that Jude refers to this. And it's, he says that, that uh, Michael, the archangel, and Lucifer, Satan, were arguing over the body of, Jesus, of, of Moses. Okay, well, we don't know anything about that really. But it's scripture, so apparently this happened. And Jude uses it as an example. And he says, Michael did not uh, rebuke uh, Satan, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So here's Michael the archangel. We might say the captain of the Lord's guard. And he doesn't deal with Satan in this way. But he appeals to the higher authority, the Lord. And he says, the Lord rebuke you. So what does that say for us Christians running around making fun of the devil and saying, I think it's unwise. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a rabbit trail. But just to say that in this case, Pharaoh's called up his magicians. They're supposed to be experts at this kind of thing. But believe it or not, at least they had the integrity to not lie to Pharaoh. They said, we don't know. We don't know what this means. And so here's the, the, uh, the chief cupbearer, which is sort of like, in a lot of ways, the, the right-hand man of the, of the king, of Pharaoh. Uh, if somebody wanted to poison the king, they put it in his drink and kills him. So the cupbearer, one of the biggest things he does is he takes a sip before the king does. And okay, so if the king, does, if the cupbearer is still alive, then it's okay for the king to. So you trust this guy. You're trusting this guy with your life. So the cupbearer says, I remember a mistake I've made. I was in jail, in prison, and there was a Hebrew guy there that knew how to interpret dreams. So they get Joseph in there. And you see, the Egyptians were all about cleanliness. You'll see that, of course, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have taken a guy from prison and put him right in front of the king anyway, but you definitely see it here uh, in Egypt. It says, you know, he's clean-shaven. A lot of the Arabs in that area of the world uh, would have had uh, facial hair, uh, not always unkept. I mean, you can see many, many of them had, you know, very distinct facial hair if you see some of the pictures and drawings and statues and so forth. But the Egyptians did not. The Egyptians were usually very clean shaven. Uh, and so uh, they clean him up and bring him in. And it says, Pharaoh says, I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now I want you to see what Joseph says. It is not me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Now, Joseph is in, pray, in prison. He's a slave. He's not an Egyptian. He's a Hebrew, which considered from the Egyptian standpoint, the Hebrews were nasty and low-class sheep herders. And so, you know, Joseph's not really in the best standing to speak up for his faith, you might say. But he clearly does. He says, I don't have the interpretation. God will give it to you. We need to not miss that, okay? Because that is a major point in chapter 41. That Joseph is God's prophet, you might say, to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, with all of, who's a God himself. Egyptians worship the Pharaohs. And all the Egyptian gods. And here is, is Joseph, little Joseph, right out of prison. 
And he says to the, to the king, not in a smart aleck way, in a very respectful way, but he says, no, I won't give you an interpretation. And by the way, neither will any of your false gods. God will give you an interpretation. So we need to see that. We need to see this is a major movement in chapter 41. Another one is Joseph is exalted by Pharaoh to save Egypt and the earth. Okay, there is distinct purposeful language in this passage that we should take note of. Uh, chapter 41, verses 37 through 40. The proposal pleased Pharaoh. Remember, Joseph says, all right, here's what you need to do. He says, the dream is one. The fat cows, the skinny cows, the, the grain, the fat grain, and the skinny grain, you know, the blighted grain, they're one. And he's saying you got seven years of, of abundance, seven years of severe famine. The fact that he had the, the dream twice means it's extra severe. And that is uh, from God. So here is a world leader, we might say, and God is giving him insight. Why? Now, I don't want to d delve too far into this. Maybe we could talk about this another day. But we see God caring about the populace. This is what we might call common grace, where God sends rain and food and so forth, even to people that, he do, that do not honor Him, the people that do not worship Him. He's still good to them. They're not necessarily saved, but He's still good to them. And here is a whole nation of people who worship false gods. And God warns Pharaoh and says, I want you to understand, you're going to have seven years of, of abundance and seven years of famine. And if you don't take care to do something about the seven years to, ho to, to put up, there's going to be lots of death and disease in the sec next seven years. Not only that, but God sent someone, Joseph, who could manage all of that. Isn't that something? See, there's so many little tidbits in here. It's easy for us to get, and we should, see the thread of Jacob and his family and Joseph and what God is doing for Israel. We're meant to do that, okay? That's the main thread, okay? But below that, we can also see here is God caring for lost men and women and boys and girls in a, in a pagan nation. And, and God is warning Pharaoh and providing a man who can do this. I just find that fascinating. And by the way, we said that's one of the major, major themes. That God is in absolute control of everything. When it looked like, I'm sorry. Not in a saving way, but I think he did. We were going to get to that, but he did in a way recognize that at least there's some validity to Joseph's God. The Hebrew God, yeah. I don't think, and my personal opinion is he didn't repent of his sins and become a believer. But I think he recognized this God is real because he's given Joseph this, this understanding. But, but notice what's happening here. I mean, we, we could say that, that, that God is, well, let me, let me go back here. He says, can we find a man like this in whom uh, is the Spirit of God? And, and grant that this is a pagan leader who is recognizing Joseph's God. Okay, so we wouldn't want to read into that all of our theology because he doesn't have all that. But what we do see is that he is recognizing that Joseph's God is the God who's revealing this. And Joseph's God is the one that put Joseph here. And Joseph's God is the one that has given him wisdom to know what to do in these 14 years. And therefore, he has the wisdom to say, who else could be the right man for this job? But notice what's... Uh, well, let's, let me read on here before I make that point. Then, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all of this, there is none so discerning and wise as you. 
You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Genesis 41, 56 and 57. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy a grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now, we need to see that Joseph is exalted by Pharaoh to save Egypt, and I say, and the earth. Notice the, bank, the language there. It says, all the earth. Did you see that? Now, some would explain that away in a couple of ways. Some people would rebuke me very quickly and say, well, Scott, you're using a crass literalism. And, I'm, and I would say, no, I'm not. You haven't heard me out yet. <laughs> but number two, some people might say, um, well, this doesn't mean all the earth. It means all of the known world to the Hebrews at that time. And I would say, yes. That, I agree with that. That is what it means. But there is clear implications here in my mind uh, that it's, this, doesn't, this is not just a generalization of saying, oh, well, Egypt was having a famine and so were the Syrians and so were the Canaanites and that's all that means. No, I think there's, there's a purpose here in, in the reason that God has phrased this the way he, he has. And why? Because Joseph is a type. Joseph is a type that we see over and over. We're going to see Joseph here, but we also, in this story that Moses is writing, Moses himself is one of these types. So also is Daniel. And what is the type? Well, it's... It is someone that has been taken into an enemy's possession who refused to worship the gods of those, those people but was used, in fact, by God to deliver His people out of the oppression and to faithfulness to God. Okay? Moses is the deliverer, isn't he? Moses was in Egypt. The people of Israel were under oppression. And so what does God do? God uses Moses in the Egyptian land. He teaches him in all the wisdom, the Bible says, of the Egyptians. But what does Moses do? He follows the true and living God and eventually delivers God's people out of Egypt, not to worship the gods of Egypt. We have Joseph who's taken captive, falsely accused, essentially put to death. Notice, he's, notice the passage says, and he was taken from the pit. Now we've already said, the pit here is not really a pit. This is the royal place where, where this is where, um, you know, people that the king puts in, in prison, okay? This is not the dungeon. This is not you know, where there's this maggots and worms and, you know, and all that. We're, Mo, uh, Joseph is using a hyperbole here. What? Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, it's a white-collar jail. Yeah, that kind of thing. It's, this is where, or, or, or blue-collar in that sense that he's not a, you know, he's being treated like he's somebody. And the reason is Potiphar was someone. Potiphar was the captain of the guard of Pharaoh's army. Okay? So Potiphar was a big wig. And when Potiphar took him to jail, he took him over to the, you know, the, the nicer jail. And yet, uh, you know, and so we find out that Joseph refers to it in sort of a hyperbole way and says, I'm in this pit. Now it says again, and they went and took him from the pit and brought him before the king. What's, what's happening here? We're meant to see this descent into death 
and a resurrection to life. Moses is sent into the desert of uh, Meridian Desert for 40 years. And then what happens? He comes back and delivers the people. Joseph is sold into slavery. His brothers were going to kill him, and instead, what they do? Throw him in a pit. What's that? A grave. Do you, you see where this is going? Daniel's captured by the Babylonians. He's taken into captivity. While he's there, he goes from being a, a, a slave to being one of the most powerful men in, in the kingdom. Does that sound like anything else? Sounds like Christ, doesn't it? Came from the throne room of glory to this earth, to the pit, you might say, and died upon a cross, betrayed by His brothers, resurrected from the dead to save His people. See, that's what I'm saying. Joseph is a type of that. It's not that, that, that the whole world was in famine. That whole region was in famine. But the Bible uses the word all the world there because it's, it's setting up this typology for us. It's showing us this pattern. God over and over is showing us, I'm going to do this with the Messiah. Your Savior is going to suffer and then save. But the Jews couldn't see it, could they? We saw that this morning. They were blinded by their legalism. And then lastly, we see Joseph is comforted by his new family and success. And I think there's a reason we need to see this. We don't need to just see this in, sen in a sentimental way. I think we need to understand this in, in its theological understanding that, that we're meant to grasp that Joseph's life means. In, four, in 52, and, and uh, I'm sorry, 50 and 52, it says, Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So, so basically, Joseph at this point is made royalty. It says the, the Pharaoh took his signet ring. You know what a signet ring is, don't you? Okay, that's his seal. They pour the hot wax on a document, and he press his signet down on it, and that's like his signature. You know, and if, and if the only person, only certain people could break that seal and see what the king has written or agreed to. And so Joseph is given a signet ring from the king. Then he's given a linen cloth, a, a robe, which is the robe of royalty. Then he's given a gold necklace around his neck. And then he's given a wife from the priest, uh, the priestess of On, Potiphar. And so, uh, essentially that makes, in Egyptian culture, that makes Joseph royalty. Now he has, he has, he has a priestess for a wife, he has a signet ring of the king, the people are to bow in front of him, he's wearing royal robes, um, you know, here again we get this, this ascension idea. Christ, we see in the book of Revelation, is what? In white robes. And what's he going to have? His bride coming to him. So you see this, this ascension, the royal ascension. Uh, over and over you'll see this in the, in, the, in the Bible. And you see it here in the picture of Joseph uh, as well. But he says, Joseph called the name of the one Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all of my hardship and all of my father's house and the name of the second Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So, in, so what, what does he get from the suffering? Comforted and fruitfulness. Yeah. Yeah, it was all fulfilled. And notice that God is the the point here. 
God has given me Manasseh and Ephraim. God has comforted me. God has made me fruitful in the land of my oppression. So this whole thing is, is meant to show us the, the providential, sovereign orchestrating of God Almighty in the affairs of men. Now let's back up from this for a second. Because this is it's great to read this. It's great to, but, but don't see this just as literature. See this as doctrine. See this as what God is saying about His governing of the universe. God orchestrated even the terrible events that happened in Joseph's life. God did, gave him the dreams, brought all these things into his life, which, by the way, had he not been in that jail, would he have, trans, would he have interpreted the dreams of those two men? No. You see how God did all that. At the same time, here's this great famine that comes in the land. Would he have been able to help Egypt? Would he have, if he couldn't help Egypt, would he have been able to help his own people who eventually, we're going to see, wind up coming to him for help? No, they would not have done that. If Egypt wouldn't have had this terrible famine, would Joseph ever been called in front of the king? If the king hadn't had these dreams and none of the magicians couldn't... You see what I'm saying? Every little piece of this, God has, is, has orchestrated for His sovereign plan to unfold. And what is that plan? The good of Egypt? No, He's good to Egypt and He's kind to Egypt here. And He does wonderful things. But His plan is the redemption of His people. Remember, we also said that here was, remember back at Judah, what was going on with the family at the old home place? <laughs> Everything bad. They were marrying into the Canaanites. They were being gobbled up into the pagan culture in Canaan. So we said one of the things that God was going to do was what? Take Israel down into Egypt where the Egyptians do not want to fraternize with the Hebrews. They look at the Hebrews and think, oh, these are uncouth, smelly, shepherd Hebrew people. We don't want anything to do with them. We're Egyptians. Which then basically isolates the Hebrew society in the land of Goshen. Remember that? So now the, the Hebrews set up themselves a little community in Goshen, which isolates them from the pagan culture of the Egyptians and by the way delivers them from the pagan culture of the Canaanites in Canaan and so for 400 years God allows his nation to grow in that little incubator and when it comes time a Pharaoh arises that does not know Joseph and feels no debt at all to Joseph and he sees the Hebrews as a pain and a threat. And so they must be oppressed. So you see the pressure cooker starting. And God is going to eventually take them out of there and deliver them into the land that he had promised them 400 years earlier. And so we see God's sovereign hand orchestrating every single thing that's happening. Now, has that God left us? No, he has not. And I think it is so important that we Christians today in the secular world that we live in in America to realize this God has not gone anywhere. And secularism has not dethroned him. And Nietzsche is wrong. He's not dead. He's well alive in, I, in us. Neither is his theology dead. Neither is his philosophy dead. Neither is his word dead. Neither is his spirit dead. It's alive and well. Nietzsche's dead. Okay. He's dead. And pretty much his philosophy is shown to be insanity. But God 
is fine. He's alive and well on the throne. And so, so these themes, in this account we see these themes, the, throne, the, the theme of the humiliation and exaltation. We see the theme of suffering and comfort and salvation. The theme of God's providential orchestration of all things for His own glory, which we will eventually see in the cross of Calvary, won't we? Just like we read this morning, where Peter said, You, accord with wicked hands, but according to God's providential working, killed the Son of God. You see that? They did what they wanted. They killed Jesus because they wanted to kill Jesus. They're guilty of that. But back of that is the sovereign God of the universe orchestrating all things for His glory. He's not out of control. He has not lost one ounce of control of what's going on. And this, and this is the same God that when it's time will wrap all things up. We'll send His Son back and we'll set up His kingdom. And the last theme we see is the theme of suffering, delivering, uh, being exalted from the pit to save the world. Both Hebrews and Gentiles. You notice that. Joseph is able to save Hebrews, his own people, and Gentiles, the surrounding people. Joseph is a type of Moses, Daniel, and Jesus, each having been a prisoner in a foreign land, but being elevated by God to save others. And we see that clearly in the New Testament. All right, so that's what I see in Genesis 41. Any questions or thoughts? We've got a few minutes. Or about any of the other chapters, because we haven't done any Q&A for a while, so I'll just throw the floor open. Yeah, absolutely it is. Now, we're like Joseph. We don't always know how this fits, but it's all there. He's working, the Bible says he, he's working all things after the counsel of his will. And so, like you say, we, we may be like Job when, you know, oftentimes that's where we are. Our world is falling apart. You know, sickness, death, we're losing things. What we don't realize is God is back here in the background. You know, and He is orchestrating all of this for His own glory. And that's the thing we have to remember about Job. What started the story of Job? Satan and the angels came before God to give an account. Okay? So it's not... Remember, we don't believe in what's called dualism. Dualism is good and evil, fighting against one another, and you know, they kind of keep each other in balance. No, that's not Christianity. God and Satan are not fighting, and we're pulling for God, and I hope God's going to win. That's not Christianity. No, God is in control from beginning to end. And Satan, we already know, is going to be judged. It's, it's, he has been judged at the cross. He's just awaiting imprisonment. You know, and so, um, but a lot of times, you know, well, back to Job. Job said, or God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan said, well, if you let me do these things, he will curse you. So you see what the real issue is. The real issue wasn't Job's wealth, Job's peace, Job's comfort, Job's help. health. None of that was the real issue. The real issue was God's glory. Satan said, you let me hurt him, and he will curse you. That's what Satan wants, to curse God. He wants to rob God of glory any way he can, and he loves to use us to do it. And so God allowed Satan to put Job through all that to prove that Job 
loved God, not just because God gave him things. But yeah, you're right. God is in control today. And I think we've got to wrestle with that and, and come to grips with that because we can't live a Christian life that says, you know, God is helpless, you know, that there's so many evil things and, you know, God can't, you know, if God had his way and, you know, it'd just be, you know, that's not the case. And so often what we want to say is, well, if God's so loving and so in control, then why is there war? And why is there famine? And why is there rape and drugs and all these kinds of and, and abuse and so forth? Did God make that? We made that. Right. Yeah, we, what did God make? A perfect garden, a perfect man, a perfect woman. God had gave man everything. Man turned on God. And it was man that killed his brother. You see, we are the ones that have destroyed the world that God has given us. And it's the kingdom of men that are still shaking their fist in the face of God and saying, we will not have this man to rule over us. And it's God who, who says, I will someday set all of this back in place. But Peter says, meanwhile, it, the Bible says that God is not slack as some men count slackness. In other words, God's not lazy. He's not derelict. He's not missing or, or any of those things. But that God is long-suffering toward us so that we might, many might come to repentance. So God is not, just when we say, well, why doesn't God do something? Uh, you might want to hold off there. Because someday God is going to do something. That's the whole book of Revelation. And there's going to be millions and millions of people judged and killed during that time. But right now, God is holding all that back and saying, come, turn from your sin. Repent of this. Bow at my throne. Believe in my son. Take my kingdom. I will forgive you. All that the Father gives me shall come unto me. And they that come unto me, I will no wise cast. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly. So whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Son of Man came not into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. But sooner or later, God will set things right. And at that time, we know that the Bible says that he will throw Satan and those evil angels and the, and the false prophet and the beast or the Antichrist and all, those, and all liars, the Bible says, which is a symbol for all those that don't, don't believe in Christ, all those that love sin and hate Christ and don't want him to rule over them, the Bible says they were bound hand and foot and cast in the lake of fire. But nobody with a heart and an understanding of what it says is rushing to that. We would much rather see people repent and believe. You know. But be assured, as Psalm chapter 2 says, kiss the son lest he be angry with you. In other words, bow before the king of heaven while there's time. Because notice, that's the real issue. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't ever get sidetracked by anything else. That is the issue. Jesus is the king. And God's kingdom is the only kingdom that's eternal. And, and so Satan's so good at you know, confusing things, you know, and misting it up so that we, we mess up what, what, what he's really saying. And so, but the Bible's clear, and that's why I love studying the Bible like this, because what we get, we get the message of the Bible. You know, so, which to me, you can't improve on that. Anything else? We've got a couple minutes.
Comments or questions? That's a good one. A big one, but a good one. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for being in control. So oftentimes our lives feel like they're out of control. And uh, we feel overwhelmed. We feel confused. But Lord, we can be comforted like Joseph that you are on the throne. And that as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good to those that love God and to those who are the called according to your purpose. So Father, we who believe in you can rest at night and know that no matter what's going on in our lives, we have placed our lives, our eternal souls in your hands. And we know we're safe in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.